excited to introduce our first fireside session of the day with Brandon Moak, co-founder and CTO of Embark Trucks, and Dr. Faridin Hamdalapur, former president and vice chancellor at the University of Waterloo. Brandon and Faridin actually have a history together, uh, dating back to Brandon's university days. Did you know that the University of Waterloo has the largest concentration of math and computer science talent in the world? They also have the world's largest cooperative education program and an inventor-owned IP policy. Basically, it's a ripe breeding ground for innovation. Brandon studied at the university where he built a self-driving golf cart named Marvin and proceeded to give Faridin the first self-driving trip in Canadian history. After that, Brandon went to join Y Combinator with his co-founder, Alex Rodriguez, and settled into San Francisco. Together, they innovated and pivoted until they ultimately built the largest self-driving truck program in America. Embark Trucks also completed the first American coast-to-coast self-driving trip back in 2018. If I'm not mistaken, Brandon is now the world's youngest CTO of a publicly traded company as Embark Trucks recently listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Suffice it to say, Brandon is accustomed to solving really hard engineering problems. So I hope you're as excited as I am to hear from Brandon and Faridin. And now I'll pass it over to Faridin to introduce himself and our first session. Over to you, Faridin. Thank you so much, Nabil. And uh, thanks to um, Terminal for putting this really uh, amazing uh, uh, event together. As I was listening to you about the agenda, it's so exciting. Uh, good morning, good good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us uh, today. Um, one of the most exciting things for me when I served as president, meeting students who went beyond just studying, being so excellent in their uh, uh, classwork, uh, seeing them putting all their knowledge, all their wisdom, all their passion, and most importantly, all their guts together to do something that nobody had ever done before. And Brendan and Alex were, were, were those kind of students. It was absolutely, absolutely a pleasure meeting them and seeing what they were what they were doing. So, uh, Brendan, why don't you jump in and tell us a little bit about that journey, a little bit about yourself before we jump into expanding this conversation a little bit more. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Faridun. Um, as Nabil mentioned, I'm the CTO and one of the co-founders of Embark Trucks. Um, and at Embark Trucks, as I'm sure many of you know already, we're making um, self-driving trucks for the long haul application. Um, in my role today as CTO, I sort of have two responsibilities. The first is to build the engineering team. So that's the hiring and empowering of leaders and, and crafting the engineering culture at the organization. And then the second half of my role is the, the technology story. So how do we go from where we are today? Very much still in an R&D context of building the technology to in 23 and 24, beginning to, to commercialize the technology. Um, where I actually started though, uh, six years ago, when we first started working on trucks and seven years ago, when we started working on that self-driving shuttle that, that Faridin was talking about, um, I was actually, my co-founder Alex stepped into the position of CEO, which left me as the only software engineer on the team. So I did everything from write low level code to connect motors to our computers, um, all the way through the stack to writing algorithms to detect lane lines and images, and really just plugging things together and making things happen. And very much in the early days, it was all about proof of concepts and, and building prototypes, um, engineering really quickly. And over the last six years, I've been stepping through the, the layers of abstraction within the engineering uh, organization and it's been a really fun fun journey i've learned a lot um, along the way so brendan that's great but i just want to i just want to go back to the day that uh you and alex um uh wanted to give me a tour on the uh, that little um golf car and uh i questioned i said well i've i've, I've seen the campus many times i went around the uh ring road so many times and what's so unique about this one and they said well because uh it's gonna drive itself uh so well that's a first so i remember every detail of that day and uh not too far from that few years after that i remember visiting 
map than embark trucks in San Francisco and driving that massive blue truck from San Francisco to, to San Jose and back. It was amazing, the, 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 the jump, the transformation. How did you manage that incredible leap, like going from a little campus store on a golf cart to this massive truck driving itself on the highway in the United States? Yeah. First, Jared, I'm, I'm, um, I continue to be humbled by the fact that you were happy to, to jump in a <laughs> self-driving golf cart um, in the earliest days. I think that um, shows a level of uh, trust that you had in, in us um, way back then, which continue to appreciate. But yeah, I think the journey itself um, was very incremental. You know, over that, that summer that we took to, to build that golf cart, um, really our goal was just to build a, a proof of concept self-driving vehicle. We were very inspired by um, all of the work that had been um, happening in the self-driving vehicle space. This was back in 2015, 2016, where everything was pretty new um, and everybody was trying to figure out how to build the technology, what's the best application for it. And, you know, as students, we thought that, you know, the time to get in the industry was now, right? If we waited till we graduated, then we would have missed the opportunity entirely. And so we said like, um, let's take the summer. And one, one of the fantastic things that I think the University of Waterloo does is that they have this co-op program, but not very many people know this, but there's a, actually a program within that where you can actually spend your co-op opportunity to try to build a business on your own. And it was actually through that program that we got the, the time and space and support to actually work on this. So that was the, the very beginnings of the program was, let's just build a self-driving golf cart because it was fun. And, and we did pitch it as a business back then, but internally um, it was just this really cool that we wanted to work on. Um, from there, the, the next step for us was um, legitimizing us, ourselves and continuing to build up the technology. So we took what was very much a demonstration of the technology where we drove you around on Ring Road, and we said, how can we actually apply this um, in a business context? And so we kind of squinted at our golf cart and said, like, you know, this kind of looks like a shuttle. So let's turn this into a shuttle service. And we applied to an accelerator program uh, out in Silicon Valley called Y Combinator. Um, at that time, they were a fully in-person accelerator program, um, but I'm happy to share that since the pandemic, they've actually been a um, remote first uh, organization. And I think the majority of their companies are in fact outside of the United States and Canada, um, which is really cool. But we went through that program and, and the whole goal of that program was um, turn this proof of concept technology into a real business. And um, you can probably figure out where I'm getting to here, but self-driving shuttles uh, didn't end up being a, a great business for us. So we took the, the golf cart, we made it into a little bit more of a professionalized uh, platform on an electric vehicle. Um, we demoed that technology at a number of university campuses in, technology, in uh, California. Um, and it was a great learning experience, but the things we learned and reinforced was, you know, building the technology and self-driving technology is really hard. So it's really important to focus on um, your application. And so closed campus environments is where we ended up trying to build our technology. And um, the second thing we learned uh, through this process was that, you know, university students were perfectly capable at walking themselves to class uh, and they had no money. So the, the business case in self-driving shuttles uh, just simply didn't exist in the way that we had hoped it would. Um, but it wasn't until we really put the, the business case, the, the theory to the test in, until we actually learned that. Um, so we got through the Y Combinator program and at the end of it, we, we decided that self-driving shuttles was not going to be the, the path forward for us. Um, while it seemed very technically achievable, there just was no future um, for that application we learned. So we took, took a big step back um, in, this is maybe, you know, the, the journey of a startup always has a lot of highs and lows. And this is probably one of the the lower times where we just realized that the, the path that we were super excited about didn't necessarily have the future that we had hoped, but we weren't necessarily deterred by that. We, we, we looked at the whole landscape of different options. We could go into the taxi space and compete directly with, you know, behemoths at the time, Google's self-driving program. We could 
think about the low speed delivery robots and there were a couple of startups in this space, but uh, surprisingly there was nobody in trucking. Um, and, you know, looking back at what I said before, the, the two things that are important, simplify the problem and make sure there is a business case there, trucking just really stood out. And so I think along this path, the, the development has been really incremental, but um, we learned a lot at each stage, which helped us make the next decision uh, a little bit better. So Brandon, there's an incredible lesson here for many of us to learn. Uh, you can have the best invention, best discovery, best whatever you start up in the world. The question is, can you sell it? Right. So you, <laughs> you, you combine the two. Um, so let's, if you could go back just a little tiny bit, and if my memory serves me right, I asked you that question and Alex, said, well, did you know that you were going to do this? And you both said no. Uh, <laughs> the only thing you knew that you were coming to the University of Waterloo and you picked mechatronics engineering, which is still a little unknown thing. Why mechatronics engineering? And choosing that program, how did it help you to be where you are today? Yeah, I think Faridun... For, for me, choosing mechatronics engineering, um, unlike my co-founder, Alex, who grew up in the competitive robotics space and I think was born to be a roboticist, um, my journey was a little bit different. You know, growing up, I had always had a, a knack for engineering and, and computers and, and playing with like little robots, but I was very unsure of what I wanted my path to be. Um, I went to the University of Waterloo personally because of the co-op program itself. I was super excited about just getting hands-on um, real world experience. I felt that I was always better at you know, getting something done and building things than I was in the academic context. And I thought that Waterloo really leaned into that. Um, why I chose mechatronics is A, it just sounded really cool. <laughs> I didn't think there's anything cooler that I could be working on. Um, but B, I think the fact that it was so broad in, in the program from electronics, embedded systems, to sensors, to robotics, um, it, it seemed pretty applicable. And I didn't know exactly the, the domain that I wanted to go into. So mechatronics seemed to be this um, program that I could choose that, that gave me this, this level of optionality. And I think uh, it, it turned out to be absolutely the right program that uh, you both needed. Um, so I am, I can't even imagine, I used to try to help my kids to play with their transformers. I couldn't even transform it from one shape to another one. And I'm just trying to imagine this massive 52 foot truck, okay? And it's being controlled by, well, there are a lot of, of course, um, mechanical components, but basically the brain is the software. Uh, how did you manage this extremely soft, com complex software interface with just managing this mass massive machine? Yeah, I think, you know, every everything we had built before kind of rolled into the next thing that we built. So at the University of Waterloo, before we even got to the golf cart, we worked on a number of like really cool projects from like line following robots to these Lego uh uh, robots that would like, if you jumped in front of it, it would stop. And at, kind of at each stage, um, you, you start to notice the commonalities between all of the systems that you're building. You need a sensor stack, you need a, a bunch of actuators, you need this compute system in the middle, and then you need algorithms to run it all. And so when pivoting from the, the shuttles and the golf carts to the trucks, you know, our very first goal was like, yeah, the truck is bigger, but like, let's just make it drive like the golf cart did. And you really only have to do three things to make that happen. You need to control the steering, you need to control the throttle, and you need to control the brakes. Unfortunately, you know, trucks as they're sold today, you can't buy a truck that has a nice API to say, uh, control the, the steering or the brakes. So we had to do a significant amount of, of reverse engineering um, on the truck itself to understand how it, it worked. Um, we had a theory that the truck platform that we we're building on top of we could control it with a computer just because it had a advanced con cruise control system on it so that means there's computers inside it that was controlling the brakes and the throttle and, and we managed to partner with a tier one to to get us a steering system but it was very much just like let's just work on the vehicle interface like let's just control it um, and that was the very first milestone uh, of the business and then the second thing after that was okay well now we've got control of the base platform let's actually get it to start driving itself and that's when we start to tackle some of 
the algorithms. Like, how do you see the land lines? How do you see the objects? How do we um, perceive the environment and, and control ourselves within it? But that was all built after we built the foundation of controlling the vehicle itself. So although the vehicle is much bigger, it's not too different than um, just a small robot that, that we began with. So uh, um, I was at the end of my uh, little trip uh, to uh, San Jose and back, I was mostly pleased that the brakes absolutely did. <laughs> Yeah. So that was that was that was good to know. Um, so Brandon, uh, you and uh, hundreds of others at Embark, you're still um, hard at work. Uh, what are the remaining challenges for um, full deployment, commercial deployment? Are they uh, mostly uh, software, technical, or um, uh, some regulations? And what are the uh, things that are keeping you, I should say, or we are not fully there to put all those trucks on, on the road. Yeah, as you can imagine, um, there's probably a, a couple of things to say about this. There isn't just a singular uh, technical problem that needs to be cracked before we say we're ready to go. When I think about the development of, their techno our, of our technology, it's along two axes. One we call the capability axis, and the other is reliability. So capability is what is the truck actually able to accomplish? Can it do lane changes? Can it go through merge zones? Can it pull over to the shoulder? Um, and so on the capability side, um, we've set it a roadmap where we've got uh, a number of things that our truck needs to do and we're roughly 75% of the way through that roadmap. So the, the remaining things on that list are to start handling some of the more fringe outcomes of the reality of trucking. Like if a tire pops on our truck, what does our truck actually have to do? When, when we find ourselves in a tricky situation, how can we do evasive maneuvers and, and pull over um, and whatnot? The other element to it is, is reliability, right? If you think about Embark in the first phase of its life, we were just building for the purpose of proving that we can build technology. And when you're doing that, you're not necessarily building um, a system that's ready for prime time in a commercial context. And so now we're starting to think a, a lot more about um, the, the safety case of our system, what happens when uh, a single resistor fails on our computer and we, um, we no longer can, can use that computer. How do we ensure safety? Um, how do we know that our LIDARs are going to be reliable enough? Um, there's a lot of reliability engineering that just goes into hardening the product to make it ready for prime time in, in the engineering context. So um, as we push towards commercialization, we're pushing on both fronts and increasing the capabilities of the system, but investing a lot in, in making the system overall uh, more reliable. That's, that's, that's really great. So um, there are millions of other, uh, I, I shouldn't say millions of, you know, dozens of other questions that I, uh, that will keep us here for hours, but I'm, 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 I'm not going to ask them. It's incredible to be able to think or imagine how machines are communicating with machines, but at the same time, machines are communicating with humans. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhere, uh, I'm, I'm not in Canada right now, and I'm just thinking about the ride I had from the airport to my hotel where I am right now. I, I wish that it was a self-driving <laughs> car, the taxi driver drove me here. But uh, Brendan, uh, just uh, moving away from that a little bit, um, and knowing this from the water Lucy, many graduates, especially in engineering, computer science, and many other disciplines, when they do their co-op terms, five co-op terms, incredible you know, experience they gain and everything, they have many well-paying job offers waiting for you. And I'm sure that there were so many waiting for you too. So that was a guaranteed career path, income and everything. Mm -hmm. Yet you chose something that, I mean, it may not have gone the way that it did, but I'm really glad that it did. So what made you so sure that you wanted to be a founder and not just go and work for somebody, regardless of how much, how well they were willing to pay you? Yeah, that, that's a great question and, and one that I reflect on a lot. Um, I think that the simple answer is I, I didn't necessarily have a vision for where I wanted my career to be. I think being a founder was always something that really excited me. And, and going to Waterloo, I think one of the most exciting things was just being immersed in the entrepreneurship ecosystem there and living in 
what was the velocity residence at that time where we got paired up and then lived with a bunch of like minded people who wanted to be entrepreneurs. But I think my path was, you know, I really just optimized for, for one thing. And, and that was just like learning an opportunity. That's, and, and what I mean by that is like, you know, when choosing different co-op programs or choosing um, the university to go to, I, I just, I, the thing I, I always tried to follow is what's going to you know, teach me the most to be a better engineer. What's going to position myself better um, in a general sense, because it's really hard to predict what your five-year and 10-year plan is. And so when making a decision to, to drop out of the University of Waterloo to pursue this journey, you know, you're right in saying that I probably could have gotten a job afterwards. And, and that was kind of the calculation is like, if I go down this path, what will happen is that I will spend, you know, minimum six months trying to build a self-driving vehicle. I'll learn a lot about self-driving technology, embedded systems, and hopefully I'll have something really cool to show for it. Um, and if it fails, then I can just put this on my resume and then go get a job. Um, and that's not going to be a problem for me. And I thought that like that compared against the default trajectory of just getting another job was just like a really interesting and unique story that I wanted to have. And I felt that when, when going down that path, um, I would certainly learn a lot more than the default. And it's not an easy path to, to take for sure. Um, I think starting your own company, it's, you don't necessarily have a lot of support um, when you are trying to learn, but if it's the right environment for you, um, it's the fastest environment to learn um, full stop. And so I think along the journey, I think one of the coolest things is just that um, every six months, there's a whole new set of challenges if that's learning how to build a, a much bigger engineering team or going really deep in a sector of our technology stack. Um, in the earliest days, it was just, how do you get a, a sensor system to talk to a compute system to talk to an actuator system and, and do that reliable enough to, to drive a golf cart in a circle? Um, but, but that was very much the calculation. It's just, it's not like, how do I become a founder of a self-driving trucking company? It's just, how do I become a, a smarter, um, more tooled engineer? And, and that's kind of been the, the path um, the, that I took. Yeah, um, and not surprisingly, I mean, I heard this from many, many uh, founders, uh, those who dared to enter into something that was so exciting yet, and many of them said, I don't really care if I will have food on the table this evening. I am driven by what we are able to accomplish. Many of them, you know, went on and became very uh, successful. Those who failed didn't really care. They got up, they were so resilient, and they tried something something else, something new. It's, it wasn't just what their brain wanted them to go, where their heart wa wanted them to go, and they put guts and, you know, all those th things together. And as I said, it's so rewarding, so gratifying to see those. So I am going to ask you something that, we never had a chance to discuss, but if you rewind the clock, if you were starting a university brand new, what would you suggest to the people like myself? And hey, do things differently. What would maybe, have you thought about, say, well, if I had my own university, this is how I would have done. And maybe one day you will. <laughs> yeah, I think the things, I think the base set of, I only got through two years of my engineering degree, which is, you know, for those of you who have been through it, that's that's really just enough to get you through the teaching you the maths and the the basics of physics, but not really a lot about how being an engineer. And I hope that that the two years that I did miss are, are more focused on that. But I I think while all of that was relevant, a lot of the skills that were developed that set me on on this path we're just built through a genuine interest and curiosity of how to build technology. And so I mentioned this before, but Alex and I worked on a ton, a ton of side projects. Um, and these were like electromechanical systems. These were maybe software projects where we would build websites to help restaurants uh, sell, um, sell their uh, food to, um, to their customers. Um, we would you know, spend like stay up all night building like this LED display 
uh, just just for the sake of it, because we, we loved engineering and we, and we loved learning. And it was through that process where I learned a lot about how you write software, how you make PCBs, how you connect things together. And, and that in combination with the co-op program really accelerated. So I think my advice, um, Faradin, is you know, just be genuinely curious and, and passionate uh, about building things. And it, that's where you learn, right? You're going to, I think, in when tying this back to like the work that I do today, when, when I hire engineers, I like to, to find people that you know, have taken a problem from start to end because it's not the, the theory in the middle. It's not just the algorithm that uh, if you crack it, then everything works. It's like you've defined a problem, you've understood the theory in the middle, and then you've dragged it through glass across the finish line to make it actually work because when you apply your solution in, in context, everything falls apart. And so by just working on a, a number of, of small projects through my, my tenure at the university, um, you know, you just start to build a lot of skills and learn how to, to really build technology um, with your own hands uh, from, from the ground up. So I don't know if I have advice for you specifically, Faradun, on how you should <laughs> recommend the university change. I think the co-op program addresses this um, quite well, but that was a, when, that, when I look back on my, my time at the University of Waterloo, I think that was um, both one of the most fun times, but also the, the times that I had the most learning. So, Brandon, you kind of touched on to what I was just about to ask again. Um, I know that many of our participants, they're not uh, necessarily students, but they are young engineers who have been in their careers for a few days and they have a long, bright years ahead of them. How did you, how would you kind of extrapolate what you just said to the ones who are actually practicing engineering today? Yeah. I think it's, you know, take, take your learning into your own hands. There's so many online resources available. Um, if it's to learn how to code a new language or if it's to simulate circuits online, uh, that's, that's where I got my start. It's, you know, while, while the academic career is, is interesting and provides a good foundation, uh, you really got to go off on your own and, and start to apply that, those knowledge to solve problems big and small. And, and through that process, that's, um, that's certainly what's been, been very helpful for me just to be an independent thinker and an independent engineer to, to accelerate my career. Yeah. And um, as uh, Nabil said it in his uh, opening remarks, the world has gotten much, a lot more smaller today. Um, you can be uh, living somewhere, working somewhere else, and uh, meeting with many other people from various parts of the world. So the opportunities are a lot more today than they were uh, when I started my engineering career. So it is it is incredibly exciting uh, to be an engineer and to be able to bring so many different aspects of engineering together. But at the end, this thing called software, which again, um, if you had asked me when I started my engineering education many years ago, I won't say how long ago it was, the word didn't even exist. Probably it was a different word. So again, uh, the, we know how much it has penetrated into our daily lives. Brandon, I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much. I know how incredibly busy you are and how exciting things are, uh, but um, I totally enjoyed uh, talking to you and hearing um, your, your thoughts on various uh, subjects. And I, I want to, again, thank uh, Nabil and uh, Terminal for um, organizing this event. And I wish we had more times. I think we can easily use a couple of more hours to do this. Um, Nabil, I'm going to hand the microphone over uh, to you to um, uh, who could tell uh, everybody what the next session is about, when it will start, and uh, what it will entail. With that, thanks again, everybody, and um, see you at another event, hopefully. Bye for now. Thanks, Thank Brandon. Thanks, Brandon. That was awesome.